Thanks very much. So, um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for this opportunity. It's a really great honor to speak for class four. Uh, and I'd also like to start off by saying a big thank you to all of my mentors, all of my students, and all of my collaborators, particularly one, and all of these people know who they are, uh, but it, without them this adventure would not have been possible. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about this, but I'm going to talk about it in the context of a very specific symbiosis that I work on. And so um, I study the Hawaiian bobtail squid. This beautiful little animal is a night active predator in the shallow sand flats of the Hawaiian archipelago. And it has a very interesting uh, behavior in that, or a very interesting characteristic in that it maintains a lifelong relationship with a luminous bacterium. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about this association. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, the design of tissues that interact with light. So my lab has, done, has been involved with two particular areas, the design of tissues that interact with light, both eyes and light organs, and uh, um, we've been involved in the study of symbiotic associations. And then um, I'm going to finish up addressing the title of my talk. And that is, um, I happen to be in the right place at the right time, as microbiology takes center stage in biology. So uh, as I said, these are, the, these are the main stars of the show, Eprimnoscolopes and its, and its partner, Vibrio fisheri. So some details of this spectacular symbiosis. Uh, this casual guy up here, if you anesthetize him, um, his brain will do something interesting. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what. Um, if, but if you, if you were to um, do a ventral dissection, you would see that he has a complex bilobed light organ in the center of the mantle cavity. And each lobe in the very center contains a set of epithelial tissues that harbor a pure culture of the luminous bacterium Vibrio fisheri. Now, to maintain uh, gram-negative bacteria along the apical surfaces of epithelia is perhaps the most common way that animals associate with bacteria, and very highly conserved processes direct this behavior. Interestingly, though, these bacteria are luminous, and the animal uses the bacteria in its behavior, which I'm going to tell you about, but in order for the, bacteria, the animal to use the light produced by the bacteria, it has a series of accessory tissues that surround this and modify the light produced. So what the animal uses the light for is a, is a very common behavior uh, in marine environments called counterillumination. It's an anti-predatory strategy in which the animal camouflages by matching the color, angular distribution, and intensity of downwelling moonlight and starlight so that it does not cast a shadow against the visual field of a predator looking up from below. So it's like a Klingon cloaking device or something. It's a very, very effective camouflage against predation. The accessory tissues that I mentioned um, behave in such a way as to modify the amount of light coming out so that if the moon goes behind a cloud or something like that, the animal can adjust. So what my lab has studied extensively over the years since I was a postdoc in Joe Horwitz's lab at UCLA, um, we studied the um, conservation of features of organs that interact with light. And so um, this animal's, it's been long known that the, there's tremendous convergence uh, in form and function of the eyes of, of vertebrates uh, and the eyes of octopus and squids. But also, those, those tissues are very convergent with photophores, the other types of systems that, uh, the other types of organs that interact with light. Of course, instead of photoreceptive tissue as the retina, you have photogenic tissue, which is the luminous tissue. But in any case, uh, they have very many, there's a lot of convergence between these two types of, of organs, and they often have the same, uh, the same types of, of modifiers. So, um, for example, this lens. So what we found is that this symbiotic organ in this animal shows evolutionary convergence with the eye. 
so much convergence that it's not just morphological, it goes all the way down to the molecules. So for example, this lens, although muscle-derived, has the same proteins, has one of the same proteins in very high concentration to behave as a lens, as the eye of the, of the squid. Um, but it, this goes to morphology and all the way down to developmental induction. So it's really a cool uh, system. I'm going to tell you about one, um, one tissue. Just I'm going to give you a very short story about one of these tissues, and that's the reflector. And that's like the tapetum on the back of the eye, uh, which creates eye shine um, in cats and other things that have a strong tapetum. So what about this reflector? Well, we, one of my postdocs came into the lab, and we were really curious about what the biochemical basis of reflectivity was. So in fishes, when you look at silvery sides of fishes, those are guanine, those are purines. In other words, chemicals that typically make up DNA, but they are um, involved in producing in, in high concentration as pure, pure molecules, they make reflectors. What was this reflector? Well, it turned out that the reflector of this animal is made of a, a family of proteins called reflectins. And that's what we called it. <laughs> we called it reflectin. We're not very clever. Um, but reflectins were the first protein-based biological reflectors ever described. So if you were to look at the reflector, oops, back up. If you were to look at, pardon? If you were to look at the reflector, you would see that the protein is laid down in imbricated layers, and those imbricated layers are at a certain wavelength to, to, to emit, to reflect back um, the light that is produced by the bacterial symbionts. And so it causes the light um, to be, gosh darn it, it causes the light to be reflected in, the, in this direction. No stray light going out the back. So um, if you were to take the pure protein here uh, and look at it, it is really strange protein. And so the reflectin, it's composed of, it's a 33 kD protein for those of you who are biochemists. And it is made of a series of tandem repeats. And 75% of the protein is made up of five amino acids. And there are some amino acids that are really common in proteins like alanine and lysine that are absolutely absent or in very low concentration. So very, very strange proteins. So what about these proteins? I mean, where do you go from there? Well, my lab is continuing to study them in symbiosis. But I wanted to tell you about discovery to application. So what we're doing here is we're exploiting the experiments that nature has done, and I want to make a plug for basic research, because I don't think that the people who, would, who, apply, who are applying this would have ever found this protein if there wasn't some graduate student or postdoc who knew something about squids <laughs> and, began to, and began to look uh, at this animal. So what I mean is, I wanted to mention here, is this is an example that many of you may know about. Uh, where, you went, where we went from discovery to application. And so this is the green fluorescent protein here that came from a jellyfish. And the thing that's, the reason I gave this example is because Jim Warren was my PhD advisor. And Jay Woodland Hastings was my academic grandfather. And when Jim was a, was a graduate student with Woody Hastings, they discovered GFP in the jellyfish. And actually, they were the ones that discovered that it was a, that it was a green fluorescent protein that was the secondary emitter. And then um, scientists went on. The application led to a Nobel Prize awarded to others in 2008 for the application of this particular protein to um, various uh, biology. I mean, it's revolutionized biology in many ways. So what about reflectance? Well, um, I was invited this past November to give a seminar at UC Irvine in engineering. And I thought, oh my god, <laughs> I don't know anything about engineering. But the engineers at UC Irvine, particularly this one young guy, Alon Garotsky, who's a fourth year assistant professor there, wanted to know about the history of reflectance. And so he invited me out to give a seminar. So I get there, and um, it turns out that in November he had six people in his lab working on reflect, uh, three of whom were working on reflectance. 
and I looked him up the other day. I was going to the University of Washington to give a seminar, and I thought, I'm going to look him up because I'm going to talk about this at Washington. And this is just, you know, April. Uh, and he now has 25 people in his lab, and 15 of them are working on reflectance. He got money somewhere. Okay, so um, what is Alon doing with this? What Alon is doing with this is that um, he is putting this uh, protein, he's learned a way to produce it in high concentrations in vitro. He's putting it in pieces of tape and creating camouflage uh, material so that um, people like soldiers can't be seen with infrared cameras. And so, I mean, it's just breathtaking what he's, in my opinion, what he's doing with it. The other thing that reflectins, it turns out that reflectins are the most electrically conductive biological materials ever described. I mean, how cool is that? And so um, he, he and his lab um, are, are working on this, and the idea is, he tells me, and I don't know whether or not this will be true, but it certainly is cool, that the stable biodegradable reflectins are being developed for use as conductive material in transistors. And so Alon, this fourth year assistant professor, says to me that in um, five years, he thinks that all transistors, instead of being cadmium-based and all these other toxic heavy metals and things, will be based um, on reflectance. We'll see. Um, but I think it's, I mean, he, this kid has great dreams, and it's really fun. <laughs> Okay, so now I'm going to tell you another very short story about rhythms in symbiosis. So we've worked on this for 25 years, and I had to pick one thing, and I decided rhythms would be f a fun story. And so the rhythms that, mi that microbes, that animals carry, can have on their rhythms. And so I have a little quote up here from Maya Angelou, everything in the universe has a rhythm, everything dances. And so um, that includes, as it turns out, animal-bacterial interactions. And so this, this animal that we work on uh, buries, buries in the sand during the day and comes out at night to forage in the water column. And as it does this, it's, um, it vents 95% of its culture each day as it buries in the sand. And then it comes out of the sand and the bacteria grow. So it does this behavior, you know, behavioral thing on a day-night cycle. And this carries all the way over to the transcriptome and everything in between. And so both the bacterial transcriptome and the host transcriptome are on a very profound um, circadian rhythm. So animal rhythms um, are typically induced by a light cue and function through genetic, through genetic feedback loops. And so here I've got this person over here. Um, and there, there's typically a central clock that's set by the sun or the moon. And then there are these what they call peripheral clocks that are, that are in when there's only a single light cue are typically set by the sun. So I'm going to um, focus on a couple of genes that we found in the squid. These are the cry genes. Uh, they stand for cryptochromes. And the cryptochrome genes are blue light receptors. So what do the cryptochromes do? Well, the squid has, of course, two. Instead of one, instead of just the sun and the environment, it has two blue light receptive organs, the eye and the light organ. Um, it each has a dominant cry gene. And so with environmental light, as would a, a person or, or um, most other animals that don't have luminous um, bacteria, what happens is they cycle with this environmental light. So they peak right in here, OK? However, with the ES, so ES cry 2 is the one in the eye, and it cycles with the environment. ES cry 1 is the other isoform that this animal has. And instead of cycling with environmental light, it cycles with bioluminescence. And so you see um, that it is offset. So it's peak. peak uh, Peak uh, transcription is here. So, yes, cry one gene cycling, it turns out, requires that the back that the light organ, that this organ be colonized. So you can raise these animals without their bacterial symbionts, and the cry does not cycle. So it requires its bacterial partner for it to cycle. And not only that, the bacteria must produce light. 
So you can take mutants of light production, and, they, and the animal can be colonized by bacteria, but if the, if, the, if the bacteria don't make light, and they're not doing their job, the, the cry genes do not cycle and set the rhythms uh, of the animal. So, what the squid has taught us was there were two things new about this finding, and that is animal bacterial interactions are on rhythms. And we had, no, we had this sense of this very, very long time ago because there was, there was really great rhythms of the symbiosis. The other thing was that the bacteria set the rhythms. So um, the question is, is this unique to this little squid from Hawaii? Well, it turns out, it is turning out, that the answer is no. And so um, our job oftentimes has been to say to the mammalian biologists, you might want to look over there. And so um, this friend of mine, uh, Eugene Chang, his lab just last week um, in an issue of Cell Host and Microbe has shown the effects of diurnal variation of gut microbes and fat feeding on host circadian clock function. So what he's showing is he's showing that the microbes of your gut set the circadian rhythms of your gut. And um, in addition, it, the, any kind of perturbations in this seem to have, play some kind of a role uh, in obesity and sort of metabolic, very, various metabolic disorders. So are we surprised that, that animals across the animal kingdom, animals are responding similarly? And the answer is no, because animals arose in a background uh, of bacteria. And so the, the responses are, are really ancient. So I want to finish up now by just saying that I feel really privileged. Um, I am not a microbiologist, and yet was elected by, by Division 44, which are microbiologists, for which I feel extremely honored. Um, but I do feel that microbiology is about to take the center stage of biology. And I think that it is an incredibly unifying, um, unifying field. This is the growth of microbial symbiosis, 1990s to the present. And so um, here I am as a, as a, beginning, a beginning professor down here at 1989, actually. You can see that um, there wasn't a whole lot of um, scientific, there weren't a whole lot of scientific publications. You know, symbiosis was kind of, I, you know, it was a little bit, um, like if you looked at a textbook, a biology textbook, you wouldn't see a whole big section on symbiosis. It was, it's kind of a, a, always thought to be a little bit of a sidelight, something that unusual that animals did. Well, um, we know now, um, we, with next generation sequencing, DNA sequencers came on the market right about here at the end of 2006, and the field just went crazy. We could now take unculturable microbes and know who they were. And it is remarkable how this is changing the way we see biology. Basically what has happened is for 2,300 plus years, biologists used our, our eyes, our visual systems, either unaided or aided to classify the, the biological world. When next-gen sequencing came on, that actually didn't change the way we saw animals or plants a whole great deal, because they have a lot of features, but it changed dramatically the way we see the microbial world. And so this began to happen with Carl Woes back here in the mid-'70s with PCR. It really began to take off, and then next-gen sequencing has really made it take off. There are two huge revolutionary breakthroughs that this sequencing uh, brought about. The first is that in 1975 and a little bit after, Carl Woese was providing biology uh, a measure for evolution of microbes. Before that, you would ask all biologists, what is the glue that joins, the, joins you all? They would say evolution. Microbes did not have evolution. You couldn't tell their relatedness. And now you can. And so what Carl Woese did was he showed that the vast diversity, uh, the vast diversity of, of the biological world is invested in the microbes. So here are the animals and plants, these little twigs on this tree up here. So the vast diversity is microbial. And then between 2006, when that next-gen sequencing came on, we got a glimpse into the vastness of this diversity. So the bacterial phyla, or major groups, 
a phyla, and, and for those of you who are not biologists, a phylum in the animal kingdom is like comparing me to a clam. I mean, some, some of my friends might think that's a good comparison. But um, the, the, the point is they're very, very distant. And so in 1975, we thought that there were about four divisions of bacteria, and they just reanalyzed, uh, the late last year, they reanalyzed all the ribosomal DNA sequencing available, and now we know there are 1,350 phyla of bacteria. And I called Ed DeLong, this friend of mine in, in, in uh, MIT slash Hawaii, and I said, I don't believe this. And he said, what's the matter with you? They've been around 3.7 billion years. Of course that's right. <laughs> and there will be more. So to finish up then, microbes live in a diversity of habitats. We now know by this being able to, to go out into the stratosphere and sample uncultural bacteria that they're there. They're in the stratosphere, they're in the deep, what we call the deep biosphere. They are in soil and they are everywhere. They are places in places that exclude other life forms. But the other thing that this adventure has taught us, and these new data have taught us, and one thing we have learned is that whereas some microbes can live without animals and plants, animals and plants do not and cannot live under normal circumstances in nature without microbes. And it's really an amazing message. Because even though they, and this goes way beyond symbiosis, this is, these are the, the microbes in the soil these are the microbes that are just in, in the surrounding seawater. It turns out that they're inducing the settlement of marine invertebrate larvae so that they structure uh, the marine environments. And so this is quite deep. And so these are the unseen forces. Microbial sciences, I think, unify biology. I think we're at a great inflection point. And in the next 10, 20 years, in my opinion, microbiology will come out of being the center 20 pages of a 1,400-page text, intro textbook to being the unifying principle in biology. Thank you.